Boldwood presents Marriage and Mayhem for the Tobacco Girls, written by Lizzie Lane and read by Anne Dover. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter 1 Maisie, May 1944 Rain, 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 Maisie Miles muttered as she tied the ends of her headscarf beneath her chin. Where's my umbrella? Here. It wasn't usual for Carol Thomas, Maisie's lodger and mother of a three-month-old baby, to follow her out into the hallway. She'd been a bit quiet over breakfast, which Maisie had put down to her baby daughter Paula having disturbed during the night. Looking pensive, Carol swung the umbrella on one finger. Sensing something was wrong, Maisie frowned. Is everything all right? You're looking a bit peaky. I've been thinking. About what? In that moment, it seemed to Maisie that Carol held her breath before dropping the bombshell. I've decided to have Paula adopted. Maisie had been about to open the front door. Suddenly, it seemed too far away to reach. Yet she had to. It was Friday, the last full day of the working week at the W.D. and H.O. Wills Tobacco Factory in East Street, Bedminster, Bristol. She had no wish to be late. She was never late. But Carol's words stopped her in her tracks. Her jaw dropped, seeming only to be held in place by her headscarf tied beneath her chin. She took a deep breath before finding her voice. Carol, I think you need to think carefully before making such an important decision. The slender young woman, only four or five years younger than her, pushed a tress of blonde hair behind one ear. I have said it before. Yes, but only in passing. That's not true. Carol's blue eyes blazed. I meant what I said. You need to give yourself time. She's three months old, and it's best she's placed sooner rather than later. Maisie bit her lip. It was true, this wasn't the first time Carol had mentioned having Paula adopted, but Maisie had always talked her out of it, or thought she had. And I'll do it again, she assured herself. She plastered a smile onto her face and said glibly, Let's talk about it tonight, shall we? You might feel different then. By tonight, she might have forgotten about it. That's what Maisie hoped. Carol folded her arms and said nothing. Nothing signified agreement to Maisie. She fussed with her hair, dark and curly as opposed to Carol's light blonde, pushing as much as possible beneath her headscarf. Her eyes too were dark, her figure slight, and she was shorter than Carol. Good, good, said Maisie, hoping her dismissive attitude would wash the problem away. I'll see you later then. After pulling the door shut behind her, she paused for a moment on the doorstep. The weather was foul, and she should really go back inside to fetch her umbrella, which she'd forgotten to take from Carol. But if she went back in, Carol might yet again mention having Paula adopted. This time she might try a more determined stance. Best to leave things as they are, Maisie thought. Leave it until this evening. Carol was left staring at the closed door. She turned disconsolately away and went upstairs. Alone in the house, she looked down at Paula. She'd just been fed and was sound asleep in her cot her downy head all that showed above the bedclothes. Having no one else to talk to, Carol addressed the baby. She doesn't understand. I hope you do. I hope you'll thank me in years to come. It wasn't Carol's habit to read newspapers, but on one Sunday shortly after Paula had been born and feeling low, she'd picked one up. After reading the front-page news concerning the war, she'd flicked through advertisements for corsets and bovril until she'd come to the classified ads. 
kindly aunt in need of baby niece. Good permanent home assured. Right. P8345, Sunday Dispatch. She'd written as instructed. A meeting had been arranged, but she was not yet ready to tell Maisie. Maisie would talk her out of it, and she was prepared to lie, to say she was going out with a friend, and to pretend that she was happier than she felt. Anyway, it wasn't her fault she got pregnant, but it was for her to do something about it. After all, Paula was her baby, and the decision was also hers. Chapter Two It was tipping down with rain, foul weather for the time of year. As far as Maisie Myers was concerned, the bus couldn't get to the bus stop in East Street quick enough. Every seat was taken by wet and miserable-looking people, and the smell of damp clothing was accompanied by coughs and clearing of throats. The woman sitting next to her took up more than half the seat. Not quite two-thirds, but certainly more than she was entitled to. Bite your tongue, Maisie told herself. It wasn't often she got into such a foul mood, but what with the weather and Carol yet again mentioning having Paula adopted, her mood sat heavy on her shoulders. Think of something pleasant, anything but the smell and sound of a journey to work on an unseasonably wet day in dear old Bristol. Through the misted windows, she could see umbrellas bobbing along and those people without them bending against the slanting rain, coat collars turned up, hat brims shielding faces against the deluge. She drew the outline of an umbrella on the steamed-up window and glanced at the woman sitting next to her. Droplets of water were falling from the woman's hat. A sodden feather drooped over her face. No matter how many times the woman's yellow-ended fingers pushed it back, down it fell again. Normally Maisie might smile or make comment. Today, all traces of humour had been wiped out that morning. Surely Carol couldn't really mean what she'd said this morning. Her stomach churned at the thought of it. The house would seem so empty without Carol and her baby, though she understood her reasoning. An unmarried mother had a tough time in the world. She understood that. All the same, she couldn't bear the thought of Paula being brought up by strangers. Her heart would be broken. So too might Carol's. There were the usual grumbles about the weather exchanged between passengers, who on other days wouldn't bother to make comment. Ruddy weather. It's that Adolf Hitler's to blame. Hitler, Maisie mused, got the blame for everything. Perhaps rightly so. First her feet were soaked, then her legs as she stepped down from the bus. Water from overflowing drain pipes and the unrelenting downpour lay an inch deep over the pavements. Never had she felt so relieved to see the red brick tobacco factory rising like a gothic castle along one side of the road. On the opposite side were ordinary shops, selling everything from sweeping brushes to crockery, tripe to turnips. Even this early in awful weather, queues had formed outside the butchers, grocers, and greengrocers. Food was still rationed, and queues formed at the slightest rumour of something scarce suddenly being available. The rain seeped into Maisie's headscarf, and she dreaded taking it off. She knew how her hair would look underneath its feeble protection. Her dark waves would have turned into a mass of unmanageable frizz. No umbrella, of course. That's what came of lingering over a baby. Not her baby, of course, but Carol's baby. Carol Thomas, who had moved in with her some time ago. Her pregnancy was a result of rape. She'd had nowhere else to go, no one else to turn to. Maisie had considered herself lucky that she owned her own house, left to her by her grandmother. In the absence of Phyllis and Bridget, her very good friends, both serving their country, she had felt a little lonely. It took her no time at all to offer Carol a stable home. Lousy, rotten weather, she said to no one in particular. More like November, grumbled a fellow workmate as they bustled their way to the ladies' cloakroom. Beyond that, 
the clocking-in machine awaited the insertion of their individual cards. In the crowded cloakroom, coats steamed, umbrellas were shaken out, and tousled hair was combed or patted into some kind of order. Maisie shook out her headscarf, then took off her coat and hung it up. Her big toe felt uncomfortable, and she guessed what the problem was. Prepared for it, she eased off a shoe and emptied out the water that had found its way in. The soles were of cork, fine in sunny weather, but not so good in wet. Roll on the day when shoes were once again properly made with soles of leather. Just as she was about to slide her foot back into her shoe, Maisie pulled her stocking a little tighter around her toes, and blast! A ladder shot up from the hole her big toe had made and ran all the way up the front of her leg. She grimaced. It wasn't exactly the end of the world, but stockings were precious. If you laddered one, all you could do was keep the other. When another pair laddered, the good one was kept for pairing to the one already languishing in the bedroom drawer back at the house in Totterdown. When's this blessed rain gonna stop? said Ida Baker, who now sat where Maisie's dear old friend Phyllis used to sit before she'd joined up and found herself serving on the island of Malta, one of the most bombed places on earth. June, perhaps, muttered Maisie. That's when summer's supposed to start. Ida gave a brief nod before carrying on. Luckily, I don't have far to come, and I've got a brolly. You got one? You look soaked. I'm soaked through, and I've got a ladder, grumbled Maisie. Least you got here. I heard tell there's some roads blocked off around the young airfields. Troop manoeuvres, so our local copper said, but how would he know anything? They reckon it's the same on the trains, said another woman whose husband worked on the railways. My Stan says a lot of rolling stock's been diverted. Said he saw a whole train of flatbeds carrying field guns and tanks. Something big happening, I reckon. The speaker was Betty Bennett. I can feel it in me bones. She hissed through her teeth and rubbed at her aching hips and knees, as if to emphasise the point. No one disagreed with her, though it had little to do with her knees. I look forward to the day when the invasion of Europe finally happens, said Maisie, and meant it. So much had happened since she'd first walked into this factory. Meeting up with Bridget Milligan and Phyllis Mason had been like finding a new home, complete with friends who made up for the sisters she did not have. She missed them dearly and couldn't wait for the day they were reunited, whenever that might be. In the meantime, the war dragged on. My Shirley's old man told her that all leave had been cancelled. Bloody Adolf! Maisie determined to talk about something else. It was always the war, the bloody war. Once they were seated and working in the stripping room, conversation began to buzz. Anyone been to the pictures lately? Seen any good films? Betty finished sticking plasters on her fingers and began stripping leaves. Mrs. Miniver's on again at the Goldman in town. I've seen it four times, but wouldn't mind seeing it again. Made me cry it did. Maisie said that it had made her cry too. She'd already guessed that Mrs. Miniver would be the prime choice for discussion. Everyone loved its stiff, upper-lip heroism of a woman who confronts a downed German pilot in her kitchen. Everyone knew the plot off by heart and loved Greer Garson and Walter Pidgeon, and Maisie was pleased. Listening and taking part in a familiar conversation meant she could carry on thinking her own private thoughts. What would a world without war be like? Not the big things, but the little things in her life, such as looking out on street lights, with light from a living room pouring out, without having to worry about pulling across the blackout curtains. She couldn't wait to burn those. The colour of Greer Garson's hair was mentioned. Oburn. I read she's got Oburn hair, declared Betty. Maisie made comment. If you read it, then it must be true. 
Hard to tell with a black and white film, added Ida. Oban hair, just like Phyllis, thought Maisie. She'd been struck by its colour on their first meeting, as well as by Phyllis's overall glamour. For only the second time that morning, Maisie smiled. The times Phyllis had been told off for wearing bright red lipstick, she smiled to herself. Always immaculately turned out, Phyllis had had ambitions. Getting married to Robert Harvey had been a wrong move. Getting out of it had been difficult. But it now seemed that donning a uniform had got her what she'd wanted. Her letters gave the impression it had. Mick is the one. He really is. Oh, I feel so relaxed with him. I can be whatever I want. There are no rules. As for Bridget, the third one of the friends, she'd been the bookish type, and thus had always had an opinion. She'd married an American, Lyndon O'Neill, the son of the owner of a tobacco plantation. Phyllis's letters came from where she was based with the RAF in Malta. Bridget's from each of the hospitals she'd served in. Maisie Miles, I always knew you'd keep the home front going for when we return. Missing you. Heard anything from Sid? Yes, thought Maisie. I have. The thought made her smile, but then another came to her which made her sad. Dear Sid was still incarcerated in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. Sid had been a very casual date, not much more than a friend. Yet since he'd been away, their written communication had in some way brought them closer. That day of the tobacco worker's trip to Western Supermare was more vivid now in her memory than it had ever been. Dear Sid, scoffing sandwiches on top of buying fish and chips wrapped up in newspaper, the smell of malt vinegar mixing with that of a salty incoming tide. Ida interrupted. What are you smiling about? Was I? You were looking all dreamy-eyed. Got some handsome man in your life, have you? You going out with a yank? Maisie laughed. <laughs> now there's a thought. I could do with a new pair of nylons. Wouldn't mind some chocolates either. I wouldn't mind a tin of spam, said Ida. It ain't bad fried in bacon fat. That's true. My Sid would enjoy it, said Maisie. Being surrounded by friends was the reason Maisie Miles loved her job at WD and HO Wills. She'd joined the team in the stripping room not long after leaving school and following a stint working at a Bristol hotel. At first, she hadn't wanted to work there. She'd so wanted to leave a city slum behind and get a live-in job as a domestic servant in the country. Her stepfather had scuppered that idea purely for his own ends. The tobacco factory paid well. He'd wanted a cut of her wages, and much more. An out-and-out -out thief, he'd laid plans with others to elicit a continuous supply of tobacco from the factory. There were plenty who would pay him well for tobacco. Like other commodities, it was worth a fortune on the black market. Becoming friends with Phyllis Mason and Bridget Milligan had led to a change of mind about working at the factory. Miles, Mason, and Milligan. They'd discovered early on that their surnames all began with the same letter. As a result, they had termed themselves the Three M's. Now, thanks to the war, they were scattered to the winds. Phyllis had joined the women's division of the RAF, the WAF, and had been posted to Malta, the most bombed place on earth. Bridget had become a nurse and married her American sweetheart. Maisie had remained a civilian, spending her time overseeing girls in the stripping room. At one point she'd been an ambulance driver, but that was back in the days when the city was still being bombed. So many other things had happened since then. Her grandmother had died and left her a house and some money. Her stepfather had died. Not that he was ever likely to be missed. Good riddance as far as she was concerned. Her brother was a merchant seaman, and wrote when he could openly admitting in the odd letter that he did get through, that he didn't much like writing them. She hadn't seen him for a while now, and hoped he was all right. The tea bell rang. Like a flock of homing pigeons, the girls of the stripping room made their way to the canteen. 
I made these, said Betty, pressing two oat cakes into Maisie's hand. Two for me, two for you, and two for Iris. Plenty of sugar in them? Yeah. Oh, Dot's latest chap works on the docks. Managed to nick half a sack of sugar, he did. Sold the rest. Sounds enterprising. Kind of, said Betty, looking slightly guilty. He nicked a second sack, but got caught by the police at the dock gates. Got sentenced to two months. Oh, well, that's life. Maisie didn't condemn someone she didn't know. All she was aware of was that Dot's new chap had been turned down by the army on account of his flat feet. Oh, nice biscuits, said Maisie, her mouth full of crumbs. Got any more? asked Ida. No, I got a bit scared about making any more until things have calmed down. I'll bring some more in then. So you've got us to hide the evidence, said Maisie, and tutted as though she was really disgusted. At first, Betty looked taken aback. On realising Maisie was only joking, she burst out laughing. Laughing and eating biscuits only just about went together. It was hard not to laugh and hard not to spit crumbs. This was the kind of moment Maisie loved and would miss if she ever had to leave. Crazy as it might seem to some, she'd always looked forward to the working week. Her attitude had changed once Carol had given birth to Paula back in March. For Maisie, it had been love at first sight. She doted on the baby, picked her up when she cried, fed her when Carol professed herself too tired to oblige. It was Maisie who had gone to the clinic to ask for orange juice and national dried milk. If push came to shove, she would stay home and look after Paula if she had to, reminding herself that Paula was not hers, and at some time Carol might marry and move away worried her. But nothing worried her quite so much as the fear that Carol might indeed place Paula with adoptive parents. Carol and the baby lived with her rent-free, though every so often an envelope containing cash was delivered by one of Eddie Bridgman's henchmen. But cash wasn't enough for a young girl of little more than eighteen years of age. Oh, the sooner this milk dries up, the better, Carol had said on more than one occasion. Look at the state of me. She'd undone her cardigan and showed Maisie the wet patches of milk. Maisie sympathised. Carol was too young to be a mother. But what was done was done, and it hadn't been her fault. On behalf of the workforce, Carol had gone round to the house of Reg Harris, the office manager, with a bunch of flowers for his wife, who he'd told everyone was ill. It ended up that it was far from the truth. He'd been alone in that house, had plied Carol with drink, and overcome her with his superior strength and downright determination. He'd assaulted her. He'd ruined her life. On finding out what had happened, Maisie had cursed Reg Harris at the time and been almost glad when he'd paid with his life. Both she and Carol suspected foul play, especially after Eddie Bridgman, a local gangster, had confessed to Carol that he was her father. It was pretty much a foregone conclusion that Reg's death was down to him. Bad memories were glossed over. Paula was in the world and that was all that mattered, at least as far as Maisie was concerned. She just hoped that Carol would do her duty and forget about going out and enjoying herself as a young woman would. Chapter 3 The rain had ceased, and clouds of many shades of grey marbled the sky. Maisie took a deep breath before thrusting the key in the lock and pushing open the front door. I'm home, she called whilst praying that Carol wouldn't start on about adoption. It had been on her mind all day, but as usual, the camaraderie of the tobacco girls had kept her sane. With her headscarf and coat over her arm, she headed for the kitchen. Phew, I got soaked this morning. She hung her coat and scarf onto the back of a chair and placed it in front of the gas stove. You left your umbrella behind? Yes, I did. She could have said, well, I wasn't thinking straight, but she didn't want to remind Carol of why she'd dashed out of the door. 
As it was, Carol seemed not exactly happy, but resigned. I've made a stew, she said. Mmm, smells lovely. It's only mutton. Lovely, a bit of meat. If I eat many more vegetables, I'll turn into a carrot. As she took off her factory-issue green overall and tidied her dark, unruly curls by the hallstand mirror, Maisie felt thankful there was no mention of this morning's sore subject. At least, not yet. She called through to the kitchen, where Carol was busying herself preparing the evening meal. Do you need a hand? No. Paula's pram was in the hallway, just beyond the hallstand. Maisie peeped in. Disappointingly, she was sound asleep. For a while, she stood there, full of wonder. She perceived eyeball movement beneath the silky soft eyelids. What was she dreaming? Selfishly, she hoped it was about her. Ooh, too much to hope for, perhaps. Paula's skin was soft beneath the single finger she trailed down her cheek. Sleep well, little one, she whispered. I'll always be there for you. Remember that. She smiled to herself as she went back into the living room. The clattering of plates came from the kitchen. She was sure she heard Carol singing. Oh, thank goodness, she murmured. She welcomed whatever had occurred to raise Carol's spirits. Making herself comfortable in one of her grandmother's old leather chairs, Maisie pretended to read the newspaper. Carol appeared in the doorway, still wearing her apron and holding a wooden spoon. Going out tonight, are you? she asked Maisie casually. I've nothing planned. Not for tonight, anyway. Why don't you have a night out? Thinking she heard Paula cry, Maisie flung the paper to one side. A quick look into the pram revealed the baby was awake. Sweetheart, cried Maisie. She plucked the newly awakened baby from her pram and into her arms. And how are you, sweetheart? My, but you smell wonderful, she said, hugging the warm little body close, while at the same time wrinkling her nose. She obviously needed changing. Paula responded by being sick on her shoulder. Not that Maisie minded. She loved the feel of her warm body, the way her bright blue eyes fixed on her with wonder. Carol dabbed away the sick on Maisie's shoulder with a cloth. Now it was her nose that wrinkled. Ugh, baby sick smells vile. Nonsense, said Maisie. Everything about this little mite smells quite wonderful. Well, <laughs> perhaps not everything, she said with a laugh. I'll change her if you like. Be my guest. Maisie proceeded to sort out talcum powder, a pot containing cream made from fuller's earth, ideal for spreading on a sore bottom, plus a fresh toweling nappy. I'm happy to look after Paula if you do want to go out tonight. Not tonight, Carol began slowly. I was wondering whether you could look after her tomorrow afternoon. Thing is, I was out pushing the pram today and ran into an old school friend. I've arranged to meet her for a cup of tea tomorrow. Nothing special, just a chance for us to catch up. Maisie didn't hesitate. Oh, I'm sure I can manage to do that. You go and enjoy yourself. She smiled down at Paula, who now smelt of talcum powder. I'll be at work in the morning, sweetheart. But in the afternoon, it'll be just you and me. Now, what shall we do? Go for a walk to the park? Carol lingered in the doorway, wishing she could feel as engrossed with Paula as Maisie. Maisie didn't see her smile fade and a frown appear. When Maisie did finally glance in her direction, she smiled a quick smile that instantly eclipsed the frown. I really appreciate it. You go out and enjoy yourself. You deserve a bit of fun in your life. Go out tomorrow if that's what you want. You're still young and me and Paula are fine together. Her attention was fixed on the baby, so she didn't see Carol's expression. If she had, perhaps she might have questioned her further about this friend she was supposed to be meeting, or where she was really going.
Chapter 4 It was gone eleven o'clock. Paula had been put to bed at ten, and Carol had wished Maisie good night shortly afterwards. Maisie made herself a hot cocoa and sat in the chair a while. Adoption had not been mentioned this evening. Hopefully it had died a death. That's what Maisie chose to believe, because she couldn't bear facing the subject. The moment Paula had entered her life, everything had changed. She told herself she was a fool for feeling so possessive of Carol's baby, but she just couldn't help herself. The thought of Paula not being here was too awful to face. After swigging back the last of the cocoa and swilling the cup beneath cold running water, she turned off the lights and went upstairs. In the corner of the room sat the big old bureau that had once belonged to her grandmother. In it, she'd kept all her records of business done, mostly payments on loans, one or two rents on properties. There had been other money from less reputable sources. Her grandmother, Grace Wells, had helped girls in trouble. Looking back, Maisie recalled that her grandmother had never shown any guilt about what she'd done. The women get blamed for falling in the family way, and the men get away with it. Her attitude had been that she'd saved many young women from ruin, and older married women from the prospect of another mouth to feed. At first, Maisie had been horrified, but she had long ceased to be judgmental. It was a man's world, and women got by in any way they could. The inside of the bureau smelt of beeswax and ink. There were less papers filed in here than there had been in her grandmother's day. The ledgers her grandmother had used to record loan payments from debtors were still in the bottom drawer. Maisie had burned the one referring to money received for terminations. The tortoiseshell fountain pen drank deeply from the bottle of ink. She hadn't written anything for quite a while, thanks to the demands of the new arrival. Resisting Paula in favour of writing a letter had been impossible. Taking the latest battered card from Sid, she read the few words he'd scribbled in pencil. Maisie Miles, how would you like to change your name to Maisie Powell? Love, Sid. On first reading it, she'd smiled, then laughed. Few words, certainly, but direct and to the point. She understood why he'd asked, or thought she did. He needed to believe there would be something to come back to someone waiting for him. Sometimes she'd sent him a food parcel, a tin of Spam, one of Pilchards, and another of corned beef. Although only a small parcel, there was no guarantee that it would get to him. The letters did. She'd asked him about the food parcels. Only one had got through. That one, just a solitary tin of corned beef. The Japs aren't keen on beef. His response had troubled her. It meant food parcels were being picked over and seldom going to where they were intended. Now how should she reply to his latest message? She tapped the top of the pen against her teeth. Did she want to marry him? She did some deep thinking and concluded that it didn't matter what she wanted. Sid needed hope. Mrs. Maisie Powell has a certain ring to it. Roll on the day. Spam on the way. Just take care of yourself so you do eventually get here. I'll be waiting. Love, Maisie. She folded up the letter and stuck it around the edges. Before closing the bureau, she took out the old photograph of her mother and natural father, young Alf, her half-brother, standing beside their mother. Alf was serving in the Merchant Navy, and it had been some time since she'd seen him. She very much wished that he was here. He gave good advice in those moments when her resolve wobbled. Without Alf, Bridget and Phyllis there at hand, she sometimes felt very alone with her worries. Chapter 5 When Maisie got home from her half-day Saturday shift, Carol had a slice of bacon, egg, and fried bread waiting for her. You dashed off without any breakfast this morning, so here it is. 
breakfast in the middle of the day. The smell of frying bacon and bread drew Maisie into the kitchen. Oh, I didn't realise I was so hungry. You look nice, she said. Carol was wearing a pale blue jacket with a pleated skirt. The skirt was made from a check fabric that was roughly of the same shade as the jacket. Maisie suspected the friend was male. She hoped it was. Your friend must be special. Well, I haven't seen her for such a long time. Anyway, I've always liked to look nice. That's why I love being a visitor's guide so much. I got to wear a suit instead of an overall. Her sharp retort was a bit hurtful. Maisie had always worn an overall. I fed Paula. She won't need another feed until three or even four. I can do that. I'm not completely useless, said Maisie. No, sorry. I know you can cope. Of course I can. Now run along. Go and enjoy yourself. Carol waved a cheery goodbye. A sudden thought crossed Maisie's mind. What if Carol really was meeting a young man? What if she married someone? If that happened, she would no longer see so much of Paula. Was it wrong to not want her to leave? The girl was entitled to some happiness. Maisie decided to make herself a cup of tea. Weekends were usually the time she set aside for housework, but not today when she had Paula to herself. Instead of dusting and polishing, or clattering round with the carpet sweeper, she smiled down into the pram, marvelling at her downy hair, her round face. She'd convinced herself that Paula had smiled at her first, not her natural mother, and felt favoured. Now aren't you the pretty one, Paula Thomas? Time and time again, whenever she got the chance, in fact, she touched the delicate little fingers, smoothed back the wispy hair, and never stopped smiling at her. While sipping a most welcome cuppa, Maisie thought back on the months Carol had been living with her both before and after Paula had arrived. Carol had been dour from the start, crying how life was so unfair, not wanting the baby, and wishing what had happened had never happened. She'd seemed to accept Paula, had sometimes looked at her in wonder, seemingly unable to believe the beauty of the tiny human being cradled in her arms. At other times, she had purposely avoided picking her up, clamping her hands over her ears so she wouldn't hear her crying. Someone had told Maisie that new mothers did sometimes suffer from moods following the stress of childbirth. She told herself that in time, all would be well. Carol would adapt to her new life. She leaned over the sleeping baby, wanting her to wake up, even if it meant a bout of crying. As it worked out, she didn't need to wake her. Someone was banging at the front door, the noise echoing round the ranks of terraced houses. Wait a minute, she shouted. Paula had gone from perfect peace to loud squalling. Bloody idiot, whoever you are, you're going to get a piece of my mind. Bundling the wriggling, distressed bundle into her arms, she headed downstairs. If it's that blasted milkman. Baby in one arm, she opened the door, expecting the milkman, and ready to ask him to hang on a minute while she fetched the money from her purse. Instead, she came face to face with someone she preferred never to see again. Easy. Long time no see. If there was ever a time when she could have been knocked back with a feather, this was it. Eddie Bridgman was standing on her doorstep, smart as a whip in a worsted suit. A single gold tooth flashed momentarily when he said, We came to see the nipper, and Carol too. Got a little present for her. You can invite me in. No, she half closed the door behind her. This was her house and Eddie Bridgman had never been and never would be welcome in it. Carol's out. She clutched Paula closer, wishing she'd left the baby in her cot. Defiance stiffened her jaw. Not that Eddie noticed. His eyes, black as boot buttons, were fixed on Paula. That's a shame. No chance of coming in for a cup of tea, then? No, there isn't. There was bad blood between her and Eddie, and always would be. Her stepfather had coveted joining Eddie's criminal cartel. 
but that was before Frank Miles had got put away for selling rotten meat. His black market exploits, whilst working at the slaughterhouse and boneyard, had got people killed. At one time, he'd almost offered Maisie to Eddie, who was well known to favour young girls. For the first time ever, she thought she saw a look of wonder on his swarthy face. He was staring at Paula as though he'd never seen a baby before. Perhaps not one that was his grandchild. I wish she for money. She lives here rent-free. I can afford it. Eddie grinned. Oh, I bet you can. Your old granny was a shrewd old sort. You out to turn a penny? I have to go. Paula needs changing. Paula? There was fascination in his eyes. You go and do what you gotta do. He fixed his trilby hat more firmly on his head, then reached inside his suit jacket and pulled out an envelope. Give this to her. A little something to keep her going. Maisie gritted her teeth. We don't want... It ain't for you, and it ain't for you to say yay or nay. It's between me and her. His jaw instantly set like iron. She's my daughter, and the kid's my granddaughter. I want to smooth the way for them both. Understand? Eddie had initially given Carol money some time back, when he'd first confessed to being her father. Carol kept it in a tin biscuit box in her bedroom. As far as Maisie knew, she hadn't yet touched it. Much as it sickened her to admit it, the money would come in useful. Carol was all alone in the world. She could no longer work, not with a baby and no husband. Some employers wouldn't countenance employing an unmarried mother. Getting pregnant was always the woman's fault, never the man's. Being careful not to let her fingertips brush his, Maisie took the envelope. Oh, and if you do get fed up with her living with you, tell her I've got a few properties I rent out. One or two might suit her down to the ground once I do them up a bit. Tell her that, will you? Any time she needs my help, I'm there for her. You too. Only fair, you taking her in is much appreciated. I owe you. He reached out, wiggled his fingers at the baby. Paula looked mesmerised and grabbed one. The connection broke when Maisie took a step back, glowered at Eddie and shut the door. The hallway seemed unnervingly dark as she crushed the envelope in her hand. It felt like quite a sizeable sum. Her eyes were moist and her heart thundering. Eddie still scared her. The money was Carol's, and she would hand it over. What she would not do was tell her about Eddie's offer. Above all else, she wanted Carol and Paula to remain under her roof, and she would do everything to keep things that way. In time, Eddie might tell Carol himself. Until then, she would let sleeping dogs lie, and hope that Carol and her baby would never move out. Chapter 6 Carol Heart in her mouth, Carol clutched her penny platform ticket and made her way through the crowds and onto the main platform. The woman, Mrs. Edith Lavender, had written back instructing her to head for one of the two platforms in the old station, the one with the waiting room. The original part of the station was built by Brunel for the Great Western Railway back in the middle of the 19th century the new station later. A tunnel led to it from the main concourse. Most mainline trains departed from the platforms in the gothic splendour of the newer building. With one hand plonked on top of her head, to better keep her hat in place, Carol pushed her way through the crowds. It was quite a crush, and complaints abounded. The station was packed. Everyone, it appeared, wanted to be somewhere else, not stuck here on a drafty platform at Temple Mead Station. Disturbed by the sound of noisy humans, pigeons roosting overhead took off, a fluttering of feathers drifting down. Bruised in the crush, Carol managed to ask the ticket inspector about the London train. A pencil pushed behind his ear wobbled as he shook his grey-haired head. Oh, you could have a long wait, me love. 
We're doing our best. Signal failure, so we've been told. He tapped the side of his nose and winked. He was insinuating the excuse might be otherwise, but it was lost on her. She was here for a reason, and although she felt sick inside, she kept reassuring herself that it was something she just had to do. Resigning herself to the fact she might have to wait for some time, Carol headed to where she'd been told to go. The other more populous platforms were left behind. Soot and silence were all pervading, except for the sound of her footsteps echoing off the subway walls. A gust of cold air hit her as she came up out of the subway and onto the platform, which had a bleak and neglected look, a far cry from its Victorian heyday. Paint was peeling, and a skewed sign creaked above the waiting room, the words faded and barely legible. Tufts of grass almost obliterated the remaining and little-used railway tracks. This was only a meeting place. Mrs. Lavender would arrive on the London train on a different platform. The old platform will lend us privacy, she'd said in her letter. I hope to arrive by three o'clock. Carol didn't need to glance up at the station clock to know that she had a long wait. Temple Mead Station wasn't usually this chaotic in normal times, but these times were not normal. There's a war on. How many times had those words been repeated since the outbreak of hostilities in 1939? A lot. Too many. She sincerely hoped it wouldn't be long before they were never heard again. Despite it being late May, Carol felt cold. The rain had only eased off yesterday evening, but deep inside she knew it wasn't the rain making her feel so cold. Could she really go through with this? What would people think of her? What would Maisie think of her? Maisie was the kindest person she'd ever met. She'd looked out for her from the very first time she'd reported for work at W.D. and H.O. Wills, and she'd been happy there. But her life had been thrown upside down. To her mind, it made sense to cut all ties with the city where the worst possible thing had happened to her. Once it was done, she would depart for a new place. London, perhaps, or even further away. Perhaps she could join up. Maisie, too, would then be unencumbered with her and her illegitimate child. It would be a fresh start for all of them. For most of last night, she'd laid awake telling herself she was being sensible and that both Paula and Maisie would adjust. It didn't stop her feeling guilty. She trembled at the thought of telling Maisie that she'd lied and wasn't out meeting an old friend, that she was meeting a woman to whom she would hand over her baby. The door to the waiting room was stiff. Her shoulder, already bruised from all the pushing and shoving of crowds, ached a bit more with the effort of forcing it open. The room was semi-derelict, and only one of the wooden benches was still upright. One was enough. She needed to sit for a while and steady her nerves. She also wanted another chance to read the instructions she'd been sent. It smelt of old dust and damp, and the draught from outside disturbed ashes from a long dead fire in the ancient grate. Cobwebs thick with flies hung ragged in front of windows that hadn't been cleaned for years. Despite the dirt and debris, Carol dusted off the rickety wooden bench and sat down. Mrs. Lavender had stipulated that she carry a folded-up copy of the Sunday Dispatch under her arm. Picking up the newspaper had been the first step to being here today. She unfolded the newspaper and reread the advert that had caught her eye slightly less than a month ago. Reading it had lifted her somewhat from the depths of despair. The district nurse had told her that many women experienced mood swings and extreme fatigue following childbirth. She'd accepted the advice silently, but days later, her dark mood had still been there. She didn't want to be a mother. Reg Harris had forced her. Her life had changed in that one unfortunate moment. Her job promotion, going out dancing with mates, dating men in uniform, the pictures, pub, and everything else now belonged to the past. The carefree girl, not yet nineteen and with her eyes on the future, had gone. 
Surely it made more sense for Paula to be brought up by a proper family. In secret, not daring to have Maisie find out, she'd written and posted the letter that she hoped would make everything as it was. In the return letter, Mrs. Lavender explained that the couple requiring a child were well known to her, though not exactly related. She'd placed many babies with genuine married couples, and she was aunt to each and every one of them. Daunted at first, Carol had gone over the alternatives. Her living alone as an unmarried mother, ostracized by respectable people, unable to work ever again. Paula, too, would be ostracized, bullied by the children of married couples. Surely her baby daughter being in a proper family home with a mother and a father could only be a good thing. All the same, she kept it to herself, knowing that Maisie would be both upset and angry. She'd got upset every single time she'd mentioned adoption. Carol had convinced herself it would be for the best, regardless of Maisie's likely reaction. It was her baby, though you wouldn't think it the way Maisie billed and cooed over the little girl. Carol fed, bathed and changed her as a mother should, but found it hard to show genuine affection. Maisie knew this, and assured her that in time she would. You're tired out from what you've been through. In a few months you'll feel different. Bet your life you will. Carol wasn't so sure. Every time she looked at that trusting little face, she saw Reg Harris. Paula was her burden, her responsibility, and therefore it was her choice as to what should be done for the best. Before she could think more on it and change her mind, she had responded to Mrs. Lavender promptly, asking her for more details. Equally promptly, Mrs. Lavender had written back. Luckily, both letters from the kindly aunt in need of a niece had arrived after Maisie had left for work. In this second missive, Mrs. Lavender had outlined what she would do and how much it would cost. I am acting as a go-between for a married couple unable to have a child. They specifically require a baby girl, and your baby sounds ideal. My fee is 100 guineas for this service for each party. I require 20 as a deposit, and the balance to be paid on completion of a form stipulating that all rights you have to the child are forfeited. Guilt vied with despair. One hundred guineas was a lot of money. Luckily for her, she'd had the bundle of cash Eddie Bridgman had given her at Aggie Hill's funeral. Aggie had been a big presence in the tobacco factory. With her husband, Curly Hill, she'd also run a waterside pub overlooking the cobbles of King Street. The money he'd given her, plus bonus and wages from when she left Wills's, would help her secure Paula's future. Eddie had added to that bundle each time he'd visited, always during the day, and always when he knew Maisie wouldn't be home. She'd never told Maisie following his visits, but thought she might have guessed. So far, she'd had no need to touch the money. In fact, she'd shied away from using it, thinking of Reg Harris, his dust-covered face staring up from a hole in the ground. Eddie had promised Reg would pay for what he'd done. There was no proof, but that didn't matter. The money Eddie had given her might just as well have been smothered in blood, but in this case would be going to a good cause. Having made up her mind to use it, she'd sent off the deposit, plus a note of her willingness to go ahead without Maisie finding out. Three days later, a letter arrived thanking her for the money and telling her the time, date and place where their business would take place. Business. It seemed such a brutal word, as though Paula was a commodity to be packaged and sold over a shop counter. The guilt washed over her yet again. She didn't want to feel guilt, kept telling herself it was the right thing to do. She had thought it would be so easy, but it seemed not. Opposing emotions fought for supremacy as she sat there staring at the floor, half wanting to run away, though sorely wanting the whole sorry affair to be finished as quickly as possible. For life to return to normal, to feel young again and not bowed down with responsibility. Time ticked by. 
The ashes fluttered in the cold fire grate. A pigeon dashed itself against a window, leaving a smear of blood. It made her start. Maisie's likely response weighed heavily on her conscience. Paula was the apple of Maisie's eye, and she'd made Carol feel guilty to even contemplate giving up the child. It was obvious that she doted on Paula. There would be tears, shouting. It was possible that Maisie would insist she leave the house and never darken her door again. Maisie's childhood had been more difficult than her own. She could be soft as cotton wool, but equally she could take care of herself and come out fighting. The sound of trains coming and going resumed. Perhaps this was her moment. She'd certainly waited long enough. Gripping her handbag with her left hand, she tucked the newspaper that would identify her under her arm and walked out onto the platform. Warm air helped dissolve the icy cold shiver that ran down her spine. The May sunshine was doing its best to add light to the miserable place in which she found herself, but nothing could brighten years and years of neglect for the old Victorian platform. Mouth dry, stomach churning with apprehension, she stood, rooted to the spot. Who was she looking for? A woman, yes. But what would she look like? Motherly, she thought. Yes, that made sense. A woman in the business of seeking out a child to fill a childless gap had to look motherly. An image of Mrs. Lavender formed in her mind. Rosy red cheeks like a farmer's wife and plump, with big breasts and wide thighs, wearing an apron and hands red from laundry or white with flour. Motherly women were natural bakers, able to throw a cake together in the blink of an eye.